as I was waiting backstage, and they were doing their Michael Jackson imitation, I just kept thinking, how perfect today, just before I was to talk, that they would talk about Michael Jackson. Someone who I think very much was told by this country that being black wasn't always a good thing. As he spent a good part of his life trying to straighten his nose, lighten his skin, to become more and more white. And as I get ready to speak with you today, part of my silence, as it almost always is, is how will I be able to tell you the truth? Will I be willing to take the risks in taking one more step forward towards you? I remember many times that I crossed this country in corporations and even the Pentagon. Waiting for a moment while I tell the truth. And deep down wondering, do you want to hear it? Today I was nervous more than I was even when I was on Oprah Winfrey in 1995. And what I realized is that today I want to share with you a story of my life. A piece of my life that still goes on almost every day. I was so struck with Y.K. when she was talking about learning how to let go of what you don't need. But I was thinking to myself, that is what I've been told almost all of my life. That there are parts of myself that this country doesn't need. That to me what assimilation meant was to accommodate to lose a part of myself. And I remember it as if it were yesterday. I remember it was Gap, my first corporate client. And I remember I was so excited and I had never done any client that big before. I had only been working in my classroom and doing small groups. And then I was to work out into the world. And I was scared out of my mind. And I remember this other gentleman who I was working with, and his name was Michael Smith. And Michael Smith was one of the best looking, best dressed black men I'd ever met. He made a three piece suit look like it was part of his skin. Yeah, I agree. It was great. <laughs> and what happened was, he looked at me. And what he said was, you know, my mom, we're getting ready to go work with Jack. And what I would like you to do is, I would like you not to wear your Asian clothing. Mm. You know, my mom, this is our first time. And we don't want to let our clothes get in the way of our message. And I think that what happened for me when I said it was I kept thinking, I didn't think there was anything wrong with this. But I thought he must know corporate America. And so what I, what I did was I went home and I started to look everywhere I could for a, some kind of jacket. So all I gave up was a blazer. And then I found I had to borrow some shoes and some slacks. And I remember coming down the staircase and my girlfriend said to me, my mom, you look absolutely uncomfortable. <laughs> and I absolutely did. And so what happened was, when I got to Gap, and I remember Michael was standing by the door, and I was wearing my kimono, exactly almost what I'm wearing today. And what he said was, I knew I should have dressed you. And he said, tell you what, I'm going to take over most of the program. All you have to do is introduce your film, take two minutes, and I'll do the rest of it. And I thought, OK, that's great, because I was scared out of my mind. And I walked into the room, and everyone 
is dressed in a suit. I mean, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Dressed to the hilt. And there I am, walking in, and I must have looked really strange to them. And then I saw him doing his PowerPoint. And by the way, people who do PowerPoints, I don't know where they got that word power. But I was watching him just clicking away and doing his PowerPoint. And the amazing thing happened because I got a chance to watch the audience. And everybody looked absolutely bored. Like they had seen this a hundred times. And so when it came up to my turn, I remember he said, when I'll play the law, when I'll introduce his film, The Color of Fear. And what happened was I nervously got out, and I pretty much had a whole idea of what I was going to say for just two minutes. And then something happened. I couldn't stop crying. And I couldn't talk. And I took that piece of paper and I tore it up in front of everyone. And I told them that today, as I was getting ready to come here today, I thought of wearing a suit. But with each clothing that I put on, I realized what I had lost. That all of my life, from the moment I was born, I never saw myself. When I was watching that mirror, I was longing to see myself. All of my teachers were white. The cafeteria help were Latino or black. The janitor was black. Nowhere did I see a teacher who looked like me. No blacks or Latinos. And so I thought the world was just normal this way. And I remembered wanting to learn Cantonese because I was born in Oakland, California. And both of my parents were born in Toysan in China. And I remember one day, my younger brother was jumping on the bed. And he was mimicking my father's Cantonese accent. Only he was making fun of him. And I think that for the very first time in my life, I thought to myself, Dad has an accent. I never knew that. I mean, he just sounded normal to me. And then I remember as my brother was mimicking and making fun of my, my, my father, my father came to the doorway. And my brother's back was turned to him as he was making fun of his accent. And I looked at my father and I stopped jumping. And he never said a word. I saw his face change. There was a sense of shame. A sense for the first time that he was not good enough to be our father. And I think that it was on that day that I decided not to speak Cantonese. I think it was on that day I decided not to go to Chinese classes. Ah, uh, but that was just the beginning. In our family, we used to save all the leftovers and food. And then we had a little box. It was a plastic box. And in there, I put bok fan, which is steamed rice. Siyu gai, which is steamed chicken. And bok jiang, which is steamed pork sausage. I put it in my beautiful little box and I brought it to school. And I remember I didn't want to put it in the cubicles because I was afraid somebody was going to eat it. And then I put it underneath my little desk and I was only in the first grade. And then I remember somebody going, oh, what is that smell? And 
then I realized that they were talking about the food that was underneath my desk. And so I slowly, with my foot, slowly hit it further and further into the desk. And then, when lunchtime came, I took that little box. And I emptied it out in the garbage can. And I didn't think I realized it totally then. But that I was throwing away much more than my food. I was throwing away my people. I was throwing away the richness of who I was. My strong sense of family. My sense of caring about my community. My wanting to share who I was. And so, what had happened was, it was just the beginning. You see, ladies and gentlemen, what most of this country doesn't know is that my parents took two and a half months to find my name. It means he who writes. And I remember when I published my first book of poems, my father came up to the podium and said, huh, well, it's about time we lived up to your name. <laughs> Fathers are so proud. And on the day that I was born, my father wrote Gary. God, I hate that name. <laughs> and why? It was because when my father came to this country, his name was Lei Hu Wong. And what they did was they decided, the immigration officials, that it was too difficult to pronounce. And so they changed it to Richard. Oh. I'm a nationally known phoneticist. I wrote the largest phonics program in the world. And I can tell you, Richard is far more difficult to pronounce. But I think that one experience made my father realize that white males had more power than he could imagine. That they could decide for you that your name was not American. That they could change your name. They could decide where you could live or where you could not live. They could decide that the language of your people was un-American. And thus began my journey in this country. And so that on that day, when I realized that being different was just a word. That people celebrated Asian Heritage Month, Chinese New Year, but what they did not celebrate was who I was, what I brought, and the gifts that I could bring. And I remember when my father was having his restaurant and he wanted to expand it. And the woman who he wanted to buy the property, who wanted to sell her property said, I will not sell it to any chink. And I remember my father coming home and saying those words to me. And thus, I began to realize that there were boundaries and there were borders that we could not cross. And I am here today to tell you in no uncertain terms that when I was growing up, in class, I had students do this, knowing out the word Xin Chong Chinaman. And it's alive and well today in every single playground in America. It's in, even in the Disney films, Pinocchio, and so many of their other films. But what I want to tell you today is this. that these eyes that I have are beautiful. That they are not slanted, that they are black, like black onyx, like my mother. And to me, these eyes are just as American as blue eyes. And that my black hair 
is just as beautiful as a blonde hair. And that this voice that I give to you today, that carries the richness of my Cantonese and Mandarin ancestors, that what I want to tell you today is that it is beautiful and it is wonderful. And that my name, my name, Lei Mun Wa, is just as American as any president and any senator and any CEO. But I want to tell you that I will not have it be taken from me. But the great myth is that I cannot take it back. I want to tell you today that who I am is who I was. And I need this part of me. Because when I put on my kimono and I carry my name, I can feel the warriors and the emperors and the empresses and philosophers and artists inside of me. So I say to you, with all the honor of my ancestors and all that is within me, and for my mother and my father and my uncles and my grandfathers, I stand before you today to tell you, my name is Lei Mun Wa. My name is Lei Mun Wa. Thank you.